Welcome to the Strong Single and Human podcast. A real look at single parenting, how to navigate the ups and downs of life with kids on your own while keeping sane. We cover all manner of subjects from domestic violence, dealing with childhood trauma, through to fussy eaters and how to help your kids become resilient. I'm your host, Claire Martin. Welcome. This week's guest teaches busy parents how to make simple lifestyle changes so that they can embrace the benefits of active, unstructured play, especially outside. In other words, she helps parents spend less time actively parenting and more time connecting. Some of the topics she covers includes how to teach your kid to entertain themselves so you don't have to spend a ton of time ton of time planning or engaging you can engage when and how you want to instead of when the kids are bugging you that sounds perfect to me and how to spend more time outside when you feel like you don't have time the weather isn't perfect nature feels too far away your kids span multiple age groups and you and your kids don't know what to do Sounds like me every day. Hi, a welcome to the podcast, Carrie Paxton Hertzberger. Sorry, that's three names I had to get out there. So it's all good, all good. Carrie, welcome, 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 welcome. Um, hey, let's start by you telling us a bit about yourself and how you got to teach busy parents how to play with their kids. I would love to tell you that. And thank you for welcoming me. I'm happy to be here with you. Um, I'm at Carrie Paxton Hertzberger. The The name's a funny story. Maybe it'll come up later. Um, it's not important, oh, okay. though. <laughs> and um, I am a mom and a wife. I unschool my two kids. It's a particular philosophy oh. of homeschooling. No, I love that. Um, where you do very little instruction and curriculum. Uh, it's basically all child-led learning and exploration. Um, and um, let's see, I run a business helping parents play with their kids and get outside more so the parents can actually get things done. Um, and my family is preparing to world school. So not only are we homeschooling or unschooling, but we are preparing to um, hopefully pack up our bags and travel as much as possible and learn about the world by being wow. in the world, both here in the US, but we also want to travel globally. But we're a couple of years out from actually being able to take the full plunge on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair enough. Wow. I would love to do that. Love to. But don't, with world schooling though, I mean, it's in the US though. You're just staying in the US for now. For now. I mean, right now we're not even really making big trips of any sort. Um, yeah. But we do want it to do both US and global. But we want to do like pick a spot and live there and and assimilate and, you know, become one with wherever we're living and stay as long as we want and then, you know, move on, find another place we want to hang out for, you know, months, years. And the thing is, I'm not talking about making a trip no, around the No, exactly. World. Not where you're like, it's like a holiday. You're actually talking about immersing yourself into right. it. And, and wow, that's pretty scary as well. Because um, go into somewhere where you don't speak the language, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, yeah, no, wow, okay, cool. So I had to deal with 265 days of lockdown, right, in Melbourne. God love Melbourne during COVID. And... It was fine for the first couple of weeks, months, first few lockdowns, because there was lots of, uh, there was plenty of ideas out there to get Oscar outside. But then we got to a point where he just got sick of it. He didn't want any of it. And how do you, how do you keep kids entertained um, by themselves? Yeah. And then not have to spend a lot of time as a parent. Because I was working full time as well. So I had no help. I got no family here. Well, we were in lockdown, so we couldn't go anywhere anyway. Um, so, yeah. How do you do that? So first, you know, I, I kind of have like a three-step process to help with this. Um, but you have to really respect where you're coming from. 
um, you know, and, and at what point you are and where your child is with that level of independent play. Um, yeah. And, you know, the lockdown and working from home, that was so hard for so many people because it, it was new and it's not like the parents had much time to transition and, you know, quite literally, pardon the word, but train their kids, right? It's a whole new lifestyle and there really is whatever word you want to use, training, teaching, coaching involved to be, okay, I have to work now and you're going to play by yourself. But, you know, and it's hard to, to fit in the training at the point where you just have to keep working and suddenly your kids are home with you. Um, but my process sounds pretty simple, but I will tell you it takes time. Okay. Um, okay. But the first thing is to connect. Always start by connecting with your child. Um, sometimes I will say, do you want me to help you find something to do? Or what would you like to do? Or, oh, I saw you doing this thing yesterday. Could you show me more about it? And you spend a little time engaging. You're in their world. They have the floor. They are in control, you know, as long as it's a, a mom approved activity. Um, and, and dive into it with them. And then, you know, that's what they want. They want the attention. They want the power. And you're giving that to them. And you're starting off right away with that. Yeah. And then is when you step away. But when you step away, you step away with really clear expectations. I'm going to step away for 10 minutes and go do this thing. <laughs> Um, and honestly, especially if you're you're working with younger kids or uh, time blind kids, um, yeah, it's really helpful if you say it by task. So I'll say to my kids, like, oh, I'm going to go away for about ten minutes and finish unloading the dishes. And when I'm done with the dishwasher, I'm going to come back and see what you've done. Okay. And you just rinse and repeat. Do that over and over and over again. As as they start to get comfortable with that time frame you can increase it. And that's why I say you really have to respect where you're coming from. If, if playing independently is pretty new for your child, you need to be, you know, start with short timeframes um, and maybe more connection and less stepping away. But putting in the time and being really consistent about it is magic. I know it's hard to put in the time. I know it's hard to be consistent, but it really is magical. Um, starting on the weekend might be a really good time yeah. to do it because you don't have the pressure of work if you are in a situation like that. Um, and you have to have the boundaries that, you know, if they come to you when you're doing the dishes or working on your email or your presentation or whatever it is, you know, you say, oh, I'm still working on this. I'll come back to you as soon as I'm done. Um, and And find some sort of reference point for when you're done, whether it's time or I have two more pages left, or I have to finish the bottom rack of the dishwasher. Um, I use that example because it comes up in my house a lot. <laughs> or I have to finish this email. Yeah. I've got to say, um, um, it was very funny because I mean, he's very, he was very good. He had 265 days to actually deal with it. Right. So we had to sort out yeah. a routine. And so what I would find is I'd spend a bit of time with him in the morning. Then he would sit with me in the office and do his work class school work in my office with me while I was working and then and then he would go off and play for an hour or so because we're talking he was five six so we'd go off and play for an hour or so but yeah. then he would come back or he'd play in my office so he'd say mommy can I play in here and he would play lego or jigsaws or transformers or whatever he was playing in the office while I was working. So as long as he was just close to me, yeah. um, so I could then interact and talk to him, that wasn't too bad. And um, and then I'd have to slot out, I'd like cut out half an hour of my time to just go outside with him and just go, right, come up, because he would be like chomping at the bit <laughs> and going a bit loony. Right. So I'd go, right, come on, we'd go outside for half an hour. So I'd actually have to cut out time. But in fact, that worked out better because I'd spent time with him. So then he could come in, have lunch, watch a movie, which gave me another hour and a half to actually then do some more work. So it was real like chopping and changing and yinging and yanging. Yes, exactly. 
But that's so important for them to have those connection points, because first, especially if we're talking about a younger child, you are yeah. their world and you are their safety. Yes. Right. Like you are the person who's supposed to keep them safe in a very, very primal sense. So they go out and they play, but then they need to come back because they need that connection. They need to feel safe. They need to know you're there and you're taking care of them. Um, and that's a wonderful opportunity too to have them play near you and okay, I can look at that soon. And then the more you can be consistent about those boundaries, even though they're like at you and like, mommy, this mommy, that I look, will you help me with this? Look at this. I want to show you this. And you know, just calm. It's, oh, hard. It is. it's so hard to stay calm, but I'm finishing my email and then I'll talk to you because then I can give you my yeah. full attention. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, I agree. So now he's getting older. He's been at school for a year now, almost. That may, getting him outside is more challenging because he's on the iPad or he's wanting to do more focused in on zooming. And to me, it's like a narrow focus. So then how do you, how do you compete with those? Oh man. So my, my short answer is you can't. <laughs> um, Cause it just winds me up. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you talk to some people and they will say screens are not addictive. Um, in the crowd I run with, the unschooling crowd, a lot of radical unschooling folks are like, no, 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 screens are not addictive. It's the real world. They should do it as much as they want to. I, me personally, I'm not that way. Um, I have pretty clear screen time boundaries in our house. Um, I should tell you, my kids are seven and five. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. And it's so not much different as, from mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As soon as I start to compromise on the boundaries just once in a while oh. i see the creep i call it like the screen time creep. yes yes um, but we have we have really clear boundaries most of the time um the kids get one movie night friday nights and it's dinner and a movie um every once in a and that's with our au pair we have an au pair right now and she does dinner and a movie with them um every once in a while it's not on the schedule, but every once in a while, if we're home all together on a weekend night and it's early and we don't have plans, we might watch a family movie together. Um, and then the kids have a couple learning games on the iPad. They're allowed to play those when one is in the bath, the other one gets to play a learning game on the iPad and they switch. Um, and honestly, outside of that, rarely, if ever, do we turn on the TV. Yeah. Uh, we do a lot of stories. My girls love listening to the Circle Round podcast. Uh, we do a lot of audiobooks. We've been burning through Magic Treehouse. Um, Dragon Masters is another one they love. And we have those on a lot. Yeah. Uh, but what I do is, is stick it on the TV and turn off the screen. Yeah. So they can't even, there's like no even image for them to stand. No, no, no. And yeah, and I... I agree. Yeah, we've got we he goes to sleep listening to stories and, and music and bits and pieces like that. Um, but the, one of the challenges with him going to a public school or a school, any school, actually physically going to a school is the influences of everyone else there are insane. And then going and doing play dates and stuff like that. It's quite interesting. Um, he does. I restrict his he gets. He gets iPad in the morning when he's eating breakfast and getting ready. Um, and then he'll get it before, while I'm cooking dinner, he'll get it then. Or to, He's actually more, he's more like, mommy, can I watch TV? So I'm like, okay. So he'll get it so he can watch a bit of TV then. And then in the school nights, I try not to, um, he'll practice piano. He will, we'll do some math, English reading or whatever. Um, it's not every night, like you said, and like when it's not every night, I definitely know when I've given in too often and um, he's like, yeah, and then it just becomes a real task to try and get back on track. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. So how do we, so you're saying with that, try and time box it as such? Yep. Um, and set those boundaries and stick to those boundaries. So is it good for our kids to be going out in nature? And if so, why? Oh, absolutely. It's good for everybody. To me, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> right, But right. there might be some people there who go, 
no, it's not good for them to get out there, especially in Australia. We got snakes and spiders and all of that malarkey that can bite and eat you, as well as other things. Yeah, so Australia is a scary place <laughs> when it comes uh, to the critters. We're not that at bad. least from my perspective, we paint it as bad. Yeah, um, and and I'm lucky. I live in the U.S. I live in the state of Maryland, and uh, really, the the worst things we have, we have a copperhead snake. Which in our area, people are really freaked out about. But generally, if you seek medical treatment, you're going to be just fine. Um, we have a timber rattlesnake. Same thing. But they're so sh- so shy. You're never going to see them. And um, yeah. I've seen increasing reports of black widow spiders in the area. But again, oh, generally, wow. these are all things. If you seek med- medical attention, you're going to be fine. But there are, you know, there are things to be afraid of out there. Um, or I know, I know ladies who would rather their kids not get dirty because then the house gets dirty. And let me tell you, I am oh, constantly what? vacuuming the sand and the dirt and wiping up mud um, and getting the kids to help with that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's undeniably good to go outside for so many reasons. It's associated with uh, overall better, better mental health, uh, better physical health. And I'm just kind of like touching the top of the iceberg. I know, There's all I know. sorts of details um, that go with it. Increased vitamin D. So many of us are vitamin D deficient. And there's a whole slew of problems that are at least correlated with vitamin D deficiency. I actually have a book. Can't say I've read it, but I have a book here. <laughs> the Global Pandemic of Vitamin wow. D Deficiency. And wow. um, I was going to say it said VDD on there. And I was like, wow, I don't know what that is. Because VD yeah. is a completely different. Um... It's a completely different thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. That's cool. Okay. So how, how do we, how do we get them outside? If like, I understand about the trying to get them to entertain themselves, but I know during the pandemic, um, and it's sort of ongoing a little bit, mind you, we are in winter here in Melbourne, getting my son to actually go outside and do stuff yeah. is horrendous. He's bored of the parks because he's been to them so many times during lockdown. So so how do you how do you get your kids excited to So a couple get options outside? here. One thing that's really helped us is we have we have a um, unschooling co-op that we go to that's two days a week and it's outside 3 hours a day and this this is the routine. You know, or if if you're a family that goes to school it could be Saturday is our outside day and no matter what we're going outside. And even if it's not to play We're going for a walk. If there's a store near you, you walk to the store or you eat a meal outside. You know, it doesn't have to be all of a sudden launching into six hours a day outside, uh, but it really helps to set an expectation around a certain day or time of day if you're just getting started, um, you know, or you are competing with YouTube or you are competing with, okay, I've been to this park a million times. I don't want to keep going there. Um, So that helps just the expectation. and, And I would say if this is something that's really important to you as a parent, um, you just do it anyway, even if your child doesn't want to. And, (laughs) you know, you just start the expectation. Uh, It doesn't have to be long, even if you're just getting started um, or you make it a nice connection time where you read a book together or I personally wouldn't want to do this with my kids, but they they take the tablet outside because at least it's getting them out the door. You know, you, you, like I said before, you have to respect where you're starting. And if you're starting with fighting about wanting to be on, you know, the TV and the tablet all the time, well, then take those things away. outside. Oh, well, I was going to take them yeah. away. <laughs> or, yeah, or just take them totally away. Yeah. That's another way to do it. You know, there's, there's, there are so many different approaches and you have to respect where you are and you have to think about what is going to work for your own personal situation yeah yeah no. if you have to work from home for six hours a day and your kids are home with you it might not be the best opportunity to just cold turkey the electronics because then your child's probably going to be at your feet and you're going to get frustrated oh. and it's going to be difficult yeah so it might be you know they're going away for half an hour and instead you're going to go outside yeah look i um, yeah exactly how i that's exactly how i started because i was like okay we'll do we, you know it was school nights so school nights was a lot easier to actually manage um so it was school nights and then at the weekends was like a set time like up till 
10 in the morning where you could have iPad or whatever. And then after that, we, you need to do stuff. Um, go play, do, do whatever. Um, we, nine times out of 10, we'd go out. Now I like going on mini adventures, right? So I like to take him out and drive somewhere and go on a mini adventure, but like just getting out and about need to, need to mean driving. And is it expensive? Like, is there stuff it, you can do that are cheap is cheap? Oh, absolutely. I'm actually, and this is something that I'll, I'll offer to all your listeners. I'm actually working on a calendar right now um, for where I am in the U S it's summer break. Um, yeah. But it's, it's how to go outside. Swap it around. Exactly. Yeah. It it doesn't really, the, the activities are not particularly seasonal. Um, How to go outside every day without having to prep and basically without having to spend any money. Um, And literally you can find outside anywhere, right? We don't, we don't have to drive to get to outside. You walk out your door or you go down your elevator of your apartment building and you're outside. Um, And then as far as finding nature, you can find it anytime you're outside. You can even find it from your window. No matter where you are, you are going to see animals. You will somewhere see plants, whether it's potted plants at somebody's house or at a store or a little tree or or, uh, weed growing out of a sidewalk. I know where I am in in our city, there are uh, lots of intentional gardens oh, and okay. nature and, and places to go right in the city. They're not huge and giant, but they're there and they're accessible. Um, or sure, you can get in your car and go to the same park or check out a new park. Um, I'm lucky I have parks all over where I am. Um, but it's it's things you can do everywhere. You know, you can... Look for a four-leaf clover. Uh, one of the one of the really fun things a lot of kids like to do is look for animal poop. You know, and it might Fair be dog enough. poop. Maybe you're just looking for dog poop, Fair or maybe enough. you're in a more natural setting and you're finding deer poop or bunny poop. And um, you know, but kids do, don't they? They like all of that stinky, yes. messy stuff. <laughs> yeah, for, most of the time, the grosser and dirtier and stinkier, the more interested they are. Yeah. And then that could be an opportunity to repurpose the screen, right? So we found this poop. What is it? I wonder yeah. what left left it behind. And suddenly we can start to see other uses for our devices. And maybe, just maybe over time, they will generalize and start doing more of those things at home. Well, that yes, because that's what we're doing. We're learning about the solar system at the moment. Six-year-old <laughs> wants to learn about. Yeah, some of the books he brings home it does worry me though. Like we have one on earthquakes, tsunamis, and something else. So, it's like obviously, yeah. it fascinates him with all of this stuff. I don't know if it's worrying him, but um, yeah, he wants to learn about it. What is a tsunami, mummy? And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and but solar system is an easier one so that's what we're doing and sometimes we have to google stuff regarding right. things facts or whatever like how many years does it take to get to the sun from the earth to the sun is sort of you know because i don't know it's 19 right. 19.3 years if anyone wants to know but you know i didn't know so i had to google it and so um yeah but it's that fact has gone in his brain and he could like recite that no problems so yeah no yeah I agree. As repurposing is a really good idea. We play maths games and we do like edu- reading and stuff like that on the iPad so that it's not just about watching YouTube or playing games as in right. non-educational games to try and do that. But right. he does need his, I sort of go, he needs his downtime. That sounds really bad. But yeah, he uses that as his downtime. Yeah. Well, maybe it's mummy's downtime. Maybe that's what it is. So it's, <laughs> sometimes it's both oh, it definitely is sometimes um yeah. so look where do you find your ideas from where can people get ideas from obviously from you but from me, um of yes, course obviously <laughs> but where um, else really i would say more often than not don't go with an idea start to notice what your kids talk about what books are they getting from the library? Oh. What YouTube videos are they watching? What questions are they asking? 
And then how do we take that outside? What do they notice when they're outside? Mm. And now this is certainly much easier if your child is used to kind of this way of being from the very beginning and they've grown up with it, but you can certainly begin to follow their lead and find their interests and curiosities and then just play on that. But um, So is that easier when they're younger though, or can you do that with your horrible tweenies, the ones that are getting into the teenage years and a little bit grumpy and yeah. want to stay in bed till lunchtime? So um, I run nature camps for lots of different ages, but uh, tweens is one of my age groups. Oh, and okay. They, oh, and this, this goes to the other question that you asked is like, how do we get them out if they don't even want to go out? Um, if you yeah. can, it's very helpful to meet I friends, right? Like if they know they're going to see a friend that can be more helpful. It's so easier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I find that when I work with the tween groups, um, in particular, the girls like to sit around and make you know, like a, a sewing circle to use a really stereotypical term there. <laughs> and they just sit around and they talk um, or they sing and they love it. Um, yeah. The boys tended to, um, we had a lot of uh, concerts, stream concerts. They found like sticks and were beating on rocks and like coordinating all kinds of things. There was some structure building going on. So I, I think it really helps when they are with friends. And then if you're kind of like, well, you know, what do you want to do? There might be some, I'm bored. I don't like this. Yeah, um, there is a lot. Yeah. My my cousin said she took her girls, her older is a tween. And she's like, I just, we went for a hike, but I let them lead. I didn't tell them where to go. I just let them lead and we had the best time. Um, but it, it could yeah, be, I, you could, you could hike or walk to like a certain oh. site too with your tween. Like you could, if there's a store, you know, if they want to get something from the store, Hey, let's walk to the store or go get a, a coffee or a, a treat or whatever. Let's, let's walk there to do it. And then just, you know, see what happens. And the more you do it, the more you make it uh, a routine, the more it will become part of them and you'll just see it grow and expand from there. Yes, I suppose it's just getting them out there and getting them into the habit of being yep. out there and um, just exploring. And I think that's a good thing. I like, like I was um, going to say, that's exactly, sometimes it's what we do. I'll go, okay, where do, where do you want to go? And he will sort of direct me as to where we're going to go. So that's that's pretty good. We usually do that on bike rides yeah. um, and try and get to, um, we normally find big hills that we ride up and down. So that's really awesome. Oh, so that's fun. good. But, yeah, so, okay. And kids love water. Oh. Water is a big draw, whether it's a stream or a pond, especially if they can get wet in it or go swimming. You know, that's a nice, like, oh, let's go here because you can put your feet in the stream or uh, that really yeah, helps exactly too. exactly and um he um we all, we also live like three k's from the beach so it's really quite good to um to just go and take him down there swimming and stuff like that although this year we had jellyfish which was horrendous so that wasn't very good Ooh. but yeah that's all good i hate jellyfish yeah yeah and um he got stung by one which isn't great like there were loads, so I don't know where they were coming from. Maybe it was left over from COVID and we left everything alone in the water and then COVID, like because we couldn't go out into the water and these things just bloomed, but yeah. So look, where can people, um, where can people get in touch with you or if they want to know more or if they want to get this um, spreadsheet, this sheet that you've got, the pack that you've got? Yeah, so you can find me on Facebook at Carrie Paxton Hertzberger. Send me a message there. You can email me at Carrie at Carrie Co. No, no, no. Let me start that over. <laughs> Carrie at Carrie Cares dot co. C-O, not com. Oh. Yeah, um, C-O. And my, um, where you can download my summer pack or, you know, for you, your your winter pack. It's 
can yes. be any season. Um, yes. It's carriecares.co slash summer outside. Oh, brilliant. Awesome. Thank you for that. That's awesome. Yes. I'll put that in the um, podcast information and um, and go from there. So, okay. So I've got a last final question for you. Um, and I did have, if you like, what would your superpower be? But I've changed it up this year. And it's what book would you recommend for my audience and why? Oh, there's so many, but I, I think the one I would most recommend to all parents, whether a homeschooling parent or a parent of schooled children would have to be Simplicity Parenting by Kim Ooh, John Payne. Okay. And um, he is a, I think he's a child psychologist. And he talks about how just keeping life simple, keeping your routine simple, your schedule simple um, is really what kids need. He talks a lot about that connection and like the push and pull of the kids going away and coming back, um, how to connect with your kids. And, and it's a really reassuring book to, um, to any parents who feel like, oh, I'm not spending enough time with my kids, talks about how your kids really do need to spend time alone. And that's good for them too. Yes. Look, I, yeah. It, and it's interesting what you say about them needing to spend time. They need to be bored as well. I think being yes. bored is good because otherwise if we're constantly giving them things to do, then they don't think for themselves. They don't actually, they don't figure out stuff. They don't start to get their imaginary world you know, and if the iPad yep. is the constant that you're giving them, um, then it's so like consumerism as such. Like they're so cons – consumerism is probably the wrong word, but they so consume what's on there and it's just being yes. – they're just being fed stuff instead of actually thinking for themselves. Yeah, it's very passive. Yes, yes. Yes. And so um, we need more aggressive play. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I yeah, I agree with you. Um oh wow. Okay, so I haven't read that book, so that's that's awesome. Um do you have any tips for anyone because I know that um I know they said that was my final question, but I've now got another one coming into my head. I know that there are lots of parents that during COVID and homeschooling their children turned around and went well one they either lost their jobs and so therefore couldn't um couldn't pay for day daycare or you know um the care facilities that they had their children at because while well, they were working so they basically turned around and said right we're going to homeschool these kids because we get to connect with our children and and actually covid was really good at turning some families around and going no I'm homeschooling them it's so much better if I homeschool them so do you have any tips or hints for people who homeschool their kids yeah, for sure. So the biggest one, keep in mind, I'm not intimate with homeschooling law in Australia. So you'll have to take oh. this and, and how it fits for you all. I think but, I think we have to follow a curriculum. I'm not sure. Okay. No, I don't homeschool my kid. But yeah, anyway, carry on. <laughs> um, when you homeschool, you, you do not need to recreate school at home. It does not cool. need to look like, you know, the full six hour structured day where you sit down and you have a lesson in math and in reading and in science and in social studies, it doesn't have to look like that at all. While it can, and if that works for your child and your family, that's great. Um, but homeschooling is really an opportunity to create a routine that works for your family, that looks any way that your family wants it to look and the kind of learning that your child wants to do. So uh, whether they're, you know, deeply researching outer space, the solar system. Yeah. And through that research, they're getting reading because they're reading information or listening to it. They're getting math because they're working with um, numbers and distances, you know, so you can really follow your child's lead, jump into their interests and passions. And while they may not have the beautiful worksheets that your other schooled students might, they are learning in their own way at their own pace. And they're probably going to walk out of it a lot stronger in the end because they're enjoying learning. So they're more apt to become lifelong learners. 
Yes, I agree. And um, I had a question pop into my head then. What do you do if your child is more, like, enjoys maths but hates English? What do you do? Um, how do you get them enthusiastic about learning a subject that they really just uh, can't be bothered with? I try and look at it as what's the minimum amount my child really needs to do this subject right now to be a functional okay. adult. Um, you know, if they really love math and you need to get them reading, maybe word problems is the way to go. Or if they like yeah. math workbooks, find math workbooks that have lots of words in them so they can be reading. And then if you are homeschooling and you can do it consistent with your laws, like I could in Maryland where I live, I would count that as reading too, because they're reading the books. Even if I'm reading to them, it's still reading. Or you can be pointing out like, this is the letter A, or this is the word is, this is the word the, can you find all the word thes? And there you go. Suddenly you have a reading lesson in your in your math book. Wow, God love you. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. That's right. It's about just finding different ways to get them to do the things that they hate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Look, and and ultimately, if they're if they're really curious about a topic, they will come around to reading oh. because they're going to dive into it. Even if they're listening to like voice recordings, eventually they most likely will get there unless there's like a deep underlying special need. Um, but generally they will come around to it or, or vice versa. If they're really into reading and not so into math, most of the time, the important math skills, the ones you need to be a functional adult are going to come, even if they don't come at the exact grade level that, you know, your school would expect them to. Yes. No, that's, that's true. That's true. Um, and look, we can't be good at everything. Um, you know, jack of all trades right. is a master of none, as the saying goes. So um, it's about actually encouraging, I think, what they're awesome in and um, and just trying to make sure they have a certain level of what they're maybe not awesome in <laughs> or what they don't yes, love. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, right. we don't want to be going around in the world doing things that we don't love um, as our job, basically. So if you love... Right. You want your kids to be happy and love what they're doing. So it's about encouraging their awesomeness um, and going from there. No, look, thank you, Carrie. Thanks so much for coming on here and thank giving you us. for having well, me. Well, no, thanks for coming on here and giving us some ideas. I've definitely got some ideas. And believe you me, it's um, it can be a struggle being a single parent and then thinking of ideas on your own, not having any downtime um, and getting your kids to go off and play without you having to supervise them all the time is great. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. the thing is, as a single parent, we have the hoovering to do and the guys over here in Australia call it vacuuming. We call it hoovering in the UK. I don't know what you guys call it in, yes. in the States. Um, you know, you've got housework to do and you've got gardens to maintain and, you know, all the horrible, boring stuff that I really wouldn't want to be doing. I'd prefer to be playing with my son, but... Yeah, that still has to get done. Like you say, dishwashers to be emptied. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yep. Exactly. So, look, thank you so much for coming on and giving us some insight into how to get our kids to play and get them outside. You are very welcome. Oh, thank you. Speak to you again. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast and you would like to hear more, please hit subscribe wherever you like to hear podcasts. If you would like to support us further, share this episode with your friends and family. And finally, drop us a review on iTunes as I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments and ideas. It all helps me to understand and produce awesome content you want to hear just like this. If you want to check out our past episodes, write to us, appear on the podcast, or for links, resources, and show notes, go to our website, www.strongsingleandhuman.com. We are also on all the usual social media platforms, Insta, Facey, and Twitter. I hope you have a wonderful week. And I hope to see you back here again soon. Be kind to yourself and remember, no one is perfect. We're all just putting one foot in front of the other and doing our best. I'm Claire Martin, 
and you've been listening to the Strong, Single and Human podcast. <laughs>